so much for having me here today. You know, when I was asked to address this conference and asked to share professional reflections, I actually went back to the year 2000, 22 years ago almost. It's when I reported on South Korea scaling down its commemoration of the Korean War in light of renewed hopes of peace between the two Koreas. And from the CNN desk, I was telling the world about the recent summit between the presidents of North and South Korea and how it had quite an impact on the way the Korean War was being remembered and that the war's commemoration in Seoul went off that year with much less fanfare than originally planned. I remember the images of cannons firing round after round as thousands of veterans gathered at Seoul's war memorials, bowing their heads in tribute for the millions of people who lost their lives during the Korean War. And this ceremony was marking the 50th anniversary of the start of the Korean conflict. It was low key and it was very solemn. The emphasis was on honoring the veterans, South Korean, as well as representatives from 21 nations who fought under the United Nations command. And I remember our correspondent on the ground interviewing a Korean War veteran, a U.S. soldier who had fought as an infantryman during the conflict. He described the last time he saw Seoul. He said it was destroyed. People were hungry. There was no electricity, no lights. And then he described the soul that he was looking at decades later, how it had rebounded, come alive. And when he saw the capital so many years later, it was such a different experience, a wonderful experience, he said. You know, Korea is best known for two things, its longstanding friendship with the United States and for the so-called miracle on the Han River. The stunning economic turnaround that has occurred, transforming Korea from a struggling nation into an economic and technological powerhouse. From the moment that you touch down at Incheon Airport, you get the sense that you're in a vibrant, prosperous nation with a tremendous amount of momentum for the future. Korea truly is a jewel of East Asia, a nation with a remarkable history of emerging from the crushing devastation of war to become a shining light of what is possible when policies are directed toward economic development, a robust democracy, and genuine concern for its people. Well, it has long been thought that the Korean Peninsula could be the flashpoint for the next major conflict. That sense has been tempered somewhat by recent developments around Ukraine and Russia and China's increasing aggressive moves in the South China Sea and speculation about the possible forced reunification with Taiwan. Still, the Korean Peninsula is considered one of the most dangerous places in the world. And unless there is more progress toward ending the decades-long tensions between the North and South, it will remain so. So as we witnessed during the Trump administration, a diplomatic solution to the stalemate can be both promising and elusive. The first summit with Kim Jong-un in June 2018 appeared to build on the sense of goodwill that negotiations between the South and North had achieved. But words are one thing. Real progress is quite another. The subsequent Hanoi summit in February of 2019 once again proved the frustration of dealing with Kim. And while President Trump's meeting with Kim at the DMZ in June of that year provided some pretty historic images, progress and peace continue to remain elusive. So how to break the impasse and move toward an ultimate solution to the fragile detente between the North and South? Well, that of course is the million dollar question. The regime in the North appears genuinely serious about the issue of reconciliation, but the formula for how to achieve it is a true Gordian knot. Speaking to former administration officials in the U.S., the most thorny issue to resolve is what political system the peninsula would reunite under. Would it be the representative democracy of the South or the dynastic totalitarian model of the North? So the United States is in a unique position to push the process forward. In the first summit, former President Trump presented a now famous video, as you know, to Kim about the possibilities of economic prosperity that reunification could bring. Former Trump administration national security officials still believe that economic development for the North is the key. 
The presentation was tantalizing, for sure. Could North Korea experience the same economic miracle the South was enjoying? There's no reason to think it couldn't. But Kim is worried first and foremost about his survival, and he believes his expanding nuclear arsenal is the best way to ensure it. That is why his pledge of 2017 to denuclearize has gone literally nowhere. Talks to bring about a resolution have historically involved representatives from the South and North, the United States and China. China, of course, has grave concerns about a reunified Korea that has strong ties to the United States right on its doorstep. The presence of nearly 30,000 U.S. troops in the South certainly does nothing to allay China's concerns. The heady possibilities associated with reunification have been presented. But how to bridge the gap between how the two nations function, how the two forms of government are utterly at odds with each other. Perhaps in the initial stages of reunification, a form of hybrid existence might be possible. The two entities would not be immediately reunited, as in the case of West and East Germany, but would adopt the model of one nation with two states or provinces that have different systems of governance. So in closing, while current global events have appeared to have put the urgent drive toward reunification on the back burner, it ultimately remains one of the most important foreign policy issues. Kim Jong-un continues to flex his muscles, firing off a number of missiles this year already. And the South continues living under the constant threat that the fragile detente could quickly come unraveled with horrific consequences. Reunification could be an extraordinary accomplishment. It's finding the path to success that remains the challenge of our time. And speaking of time, thank you for allowing me to spend time with you today.